This is the final session of the uh, 12 events that uh, have, have been part of the Heaton's Climate Action Festival over the last two weekends. So welcome all. Uh, this session uh, is um, called uh, Creating a Warmer Energy Efficient Home um, and one where we've got uh, a, a local expert and a local householder to help us do this. Next slide please. So the local expert, oh sorry, I should have introduced myself here. Uh, I'm Mel Godfrey, I'm the chair uh, and uh, one of the volunteers for Sustainable Living in the Heatons. Uh, our local expert today is uh, Anika Kele from the Carbon Corp, um, who's been working with the Carbon Corp for uh, a number of years now uh, and knows this uh, material inside out. Uh, and then uh, we've got some local experience from Julian Scott, a local householder. Uh, who will be giving his own experience of uh, trying to uh, uh, make changes to his house over a number of years, um, mainly successfully, but there's been some journeys, uh, there's a journey on the way. Next, please. Actually, I think we'll skip through this one, because I think most people will know that by now. So very briefly, why are we doing this? Because uh, sustainable living in the heat has been, has a, been in existence for some 10 years now and there's frustration amongst members that sustainability, sustainability seems only to be a slogan um, but we think there is a change taking place but that pace of change is not matching the jeopardy and we believe technical technological innovations could be within our grasp and, and are in our grasp but they're currently not matched by national or worldwide political leadership next please so we're doing this basically because we want to help you answer the question what more can I do and offer answers for what we can all do differently as consumers and as citizens. Next please. So the running order will be we'll start with uh, Anika who's going to share her practical and technical knowledge from her work with the Carbon Corp. Then we'll then um, hear from Julian who will give his householder's perspective and then there'll be time for questions and answers. Next slide, please, and welcome to Anika. Okay, thanks, Mel. I'm just checking. Can I? Can people hear me and see me? Yeah, all good, Anika. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Um, as Mel said, I work with Carbon Co-op, so um, if people haven't come across Carbon Co-op before, we're a Greater Manchester-based cooperative made up of people who want to take practical action on climate change. And a lot of, so we do a lot of work in sort of energy systems um, and working with local authorities, but a big chunk of our work is working with people who own their homes and want to sort of heavily reduce the amount of emissions, carbon emissions through heating, um, so we support them to retrofit. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a bit about me. So I've worked for Carbon Cop for over four years now. Um, and my background has been mostly in sort of um, environmental organising and um, sustainability groups and things like that. I don't have a construction industry background, but over the years I've developed lots of knowledge. Um, but I just wanted to say that so that if there are any questions at the end, I mean, also, um, often in these sorts of events, sometimes people ask sorts of specific questions about their homes. So I won't be able to give you any specific advice about your home, but I can help you find out how to find more information or give you general advice. I think that's important just because if I've never actually been into your home and also I'm not even an architect, it would be, it would be not a very good idea to do that. So that's, that's, that's that for me. Um, but now over the years, I've become a big retrofit geek and very passionate about it. Um, but I've, we've put together this poll just so I get a bit of a sense about who you are um to to sort of know who i'm talking to and so i pitch pitch it right so thanks for launching the poll um so if you could let us know who you are are you a householder an architect a surveyor a contractor or someone else um so i'm guessing we've got about 30 seconds for the poll and i think the producers are gonna close it when they have people answering great so everyone here is a householder brilliant so i'm talking to the right audience um do you have the next poll please
So um, it would be good for me to know how much you know about improving energy efficiency in much bigger homes. So very little knowledge, you have some knowledge, you know quite a lot, or you're not actually even sure what this is all about. So you can uh, fill in your fill in your answers there, and then I I'll have a sense of how to pitch the session. And obviously we can go into more depth when we're doing the Q and A. So we've got quite a fair few, 24% of people with a little bit of knowledge. And um, we've got a, quite a big chunk of people with quite a bit of knowledge. And then some are sort of quite a lot of knowledge. So that's, that's a good spread. Um, so hopefully I'm covering ground that's interesting to you. Um, and also in Q and A, as I said, we can go into more depth. So could we go to the next, next page, please? So um, what I'm going to cover is some of the basics around why, why, why I think about retrofit or energy efficiency. Um, talk a little bit about what's possible, which I know will be covered a bit further in the next presentation. Talk through some of the challenges and then talk a little bit about who carbon crop are in a bit more depth and how we can help. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just a little game I like to play sometimes. I'd like you all to sort of write down either on a piece of paper or just remember what word comes to mind when I say energy efficiency and then we'll come back to this in a couple of minutes. So if everyone's written that down, I'll give you a couple of, couple of seconds. Um, next slide, please. So net, why retrofit? Next slide, please. Um, so I guess lots of people can probably recognise this picture. It's um, quite a scary picture of the planet warming up particularly fast in the Arctic and obviously climate change is what's brought us all here to the to the Climate Action Festival. Um, so obviously Retrofit's got a big part to play in that as we use quite a lot of energy from our homes. Um, next slide please. It actually surprised me when I first learnt this um, that around 18% of all of the UK's carbon dioxide emissions comes from the residential sector and quite a big chunk of that is heating. So actually using the way we heat our homes is a big part of the problem and, and good for us in terms of a big part of how we can play quite a big part towards a solution of, um, of working on climate change. Next slide, please. Um, so we can reduce our emissions in different ways. We could decide to just turn off our heating. As shown in picture A, um, we'd probably get quite cold and wouldn't be so good for our health. Um, our other option is to turn, switch all of our heating to um, use renewable energy sources for all of our heating. So we could electrify all the heating now, which needs to be done anyway, but not really make any other changes. Um, some of the problems with that, which I'm guessing some of you will know, are that we're, we, we're sort of, we can't actually meet all of our energy needs at the moment, all of our electrical energy needs from renewables. So if we include heating in that, it will be quite a big demand, um, both of the energy grid, but also of getting those renewable resources. Also, um, it potentially could push prices up. So if, uh, particularly in terms of thinking about people in fuel poverty who can't afford their energy bills at the moment, there's some quite significant issues with just focusing on electrifying our heating and not thinking about reducing our demand for, for, for energy. Next slide, please. Um, also, please feel free to use the um, chat box. If I've said things that don't quite make sense or using acronyms, I'll do my best not to. Um, so the third option, which is the option that we really advocate is to reduce the amount of energy you use in your home through improving its efficiency um, and then look at sort of where that energy comes from. So this is a picture of a graph that one of our members Dom has put together and it shows over the years how he has made changes to his home and that has reduced his um, gas use over the years and it does show that you can make quite a significant difference. Next page please. Um, so this is what we call a fabric first approach. If you come across that, this is kind of what that means. It means deal with the fabric, which is a sort of architectural term for windows, walls, floors, um, sort of the, the kind of um, substance, the fabric of the building, you know, work on improving the efficiency of that aspect of the building before looking at things like your heating system. Um, and obviously your heating system and your ventilation system need to work together with reducing the demand. Um, but think about reducing the amount you need first and then look at solar panels and sort of other forms of, of your energy supply coming from renewables. Obviously, if you need less, then it's easier to, to, get, to get what you need covered. Next slide, please. So we've, so retrofit, obviously climate change is important. Um, normally when I do this session a bit more of an interactive way, 
I ask the audience, what, why, why else? In fact, please use the chat box if you'd like to talk about the other reasons for why you might want to retrofit. Um, I'll give you a moment or two to do that. Don't be shy. Comfort. Yes, that's actually a very significant factor. Um, we're, we've got quite used to living in cold, damp homes here. And actually, you know, it, it is very pleasant to live in a home that has a very balanced temperature with good air quality. For the future, someone said. So I guess they possibly might mean something that I use the word future proof that you might have heard about. So that means that as um, things get hotter in the future, we've planned for that. If there's sort of extremes in temperature or if there are lots of storms, some people have considered adding sort of wider gutters to their home to deal with storms, um, flood resilience, all those sorts of things. Um, save money on fuel. So there is definitely if you reduce the amount you need, you'll save money on your fuel bills. Um, it will still cost money to improve your home. So if you have a very, um, it, often these things are described in a payback form and we'll talk about that more in a little bit, but it's often not that simple. Um, yeah, it definitely feels good to do it. Also, I think there's, a, there's something about responsibility. So um, the wealthiest, so there, I don't know if people have come across this, but those who are more wealthy are more responsible for climate change because our sort of the kind of society that we live in, we often use a lot of energy um, doing things and you can do more. I mean, it's not as simple as that, but you know, if you go on lots more flights or you have a bigger home and all these sorts of, sorts of things, you, you are actually responsible. So it's actually a good way to take responsibility for climate change through those that have funds to spend them on improving their homes. So I think there is a good feeling to it and I think it kind of fits into that. Um, in terms of making your home a better buying prospect, that's um, certainly if you're improving, modernising your home anyway, uh, it'll certainly make a difference. Unfortunately, because often why people buy homes at the moment isn't, you know, there'll be some people that buy homes that have had good energy efficiency works, but there aren't so many about, of them out there. So unfortunately, it doesn't raise house prices at the moment. But that's not to say that in the future, things won't change and as you know as making energy efficiency improvements really takes off people look for that when they take when they buy a home but just to just to make sure that um at the moment that's not the case um next slide in fact you can skip over the next slide because we've covered lots of it so oh health actually go back um health is often one that isn't thought about and actually it's it's a really big factor especially at the moment with the current pandemic um, we spend most of our time indoors and actually indoor air quality um, has a, quite a significant impact on our health that not many people think about. So having a home that's not only well warmth helps the indoor air quality stay better, um, but also good ventilation. They actually make a big difference in terms of if you're an allergy sufferer, if you've got, um, there's, there's a whole list of health issues that relate to comfort, um, not comfort, sorry, relate to indoor air quality. Um, and, and with COVID, obviously, ventilation is a big, big part of, of keeping things, keeping things healthy. Um, next slide, please. So what word came to, say, came to mind when I said energy efficiency? Do you mind popping, uh, do people mind putting their answers into the chat box just so I can see? Just having a look to the side where, my other, where I can see another screen. Saving money. I'm sort of wondering how many people, in fact, there's also the raise hand function. I'm wondering how many people said insulation. Someone said definitely said insulation. If you could just either write it in the chat box or put your hand up if you said insulation. Normally that's the most common answer. Yeah, we've definitely got quite a few. Um, next slide, please. Um, whilst insulation is often the first thing people think about, just a tip that actually maintenance is the first first thing to think about when we think about energy efficiency. So there's lots of basic um, things like pointing, like broken roof tiles, guttering that's over that doesn't that's blocked or doesn't work properly for whatever reason. That will mean that your home will end up taking in water and cause cold issues and cause mold issues and all sorts. And actually, you can't really do much about you can't install energy efficiency works in a sort of in a safe way without having done those maintenance jobs first so my first my own my the biggest piece of advice i'd give to you is just make sure your home is well maintained and then start thinking about energy efficiency 
Um, next slide, please. Um, what is possible also? Next slide. So this is, um, this is a little picture of John and Pauline Grayson who live up in Presswich. So they um, are a retired couple and they really put a lot of effort into planning where their next move was going to be. They're very aware of climate change as an issue of future extreme weather events um, and also of them, you know, getting older and wanting to live in a sort of comfortable way in a home where they wouldn't have to go and move into care homes. So they decided to improve their home to something called an Enefit standard. So Enefit is, um, if anyone's heard of Passive House, which is a kind of, it's a, it's a way of improving a home to an incredibly high standard, which is sort of names, um, sort of have thick insulation, sort of what kind of U values, which is a sort of way of measuring how quickly heat travels and um, through your insulation materials, how airtight your home is, all of those sorts of things, what kind of ventilation you have. A passive house is a really high standard of that and Enefit is just a little bit lower, which is relevant for if you're refurbishing your home rather than building it new. So they decided to go for that standard um, they had to, they planned it for about five years, I think. So I'm, I'm talking about a very sort of, I'm going to talk, do two cases and this is quite, a, this is definitely on one side of the spectrum of the way you can approach things. Um, so they moved out of their home for six months. Um, they sort of got builders into um, put insulation right around their home. They sort of did a really sort of high level insulation in their loft, a really airtight loft hatch. They insulated their floors. They got triple glazed windows. Um, they also put in wider gutters to deal with storms. They strapped their roof down in case there were storms. They widened all their doors, thinking about old age um, and being able to use wheelchairs if they needed to. They really sort of thought in depth about how do we want to future-proof our home and make it as efficient as possible. Um, and on the left, you can see a graph of their um, gas, gas usage. And obviously for them, climate change was such an important aspect of why they were doing this improvement that they measured their energy use and I would recommend if that's a big factor for you and you haven't started on work yet do start taking your meter readings monthly and recording them so it will give you a sense of how much gas you're using um, and after you do work you'll be able to see how much gas you like what the difference in gas use is if you really want to get into it you can start measuring things like temperature and humidity and outside temperature you can really get into it when you get into data so but if you don't want to go that far with the data just take your meter readings you can see there on the left that they've really managed to drop quite significantly after the works the amount of gas they use and it was a really successful project um so that's enefit with a ph i just noticed the chat box um in terms of measuring things like humidity um you can get um, a humidor stat, I think it's not actually called a humidor stat, um, a hydrometer, which, so, or you could just Google measure humidity. So you can get ones where you see what the humidity and temperature are there and then in the, in the room. And you can also get sort of ones that you can log the temperature and humidity so you can look back on the data and see how it's changed over time, which is also very interesting. Um, so that's kind of one side of how you can do things. You can really, you know, totally like move out of the house, gut the whole house, you know, do a start to finish, a continuous air tightness layer, a continuous insulation layer around the whole house. Um, next slide, please. There's also, you can approach these in, in different kinds of ways. So this is um, a picture of Lorenzo and Paul who live in Levensume. They've got a really great video that talks about their way. And I, I assume these slides are being shared after the presentation. So, um, I would I recommend clicking on that link. So they, um, you know, they have a they have a, a child and a small family and a small budget. And what they did is over they sort of made a plan to start with in terms of like how do we want to improve the whole house and think about things holistically. But they took it in a very step by step approach. So the first thing they had to do, sorry about that, that's a beep outside. Um, the first thing they had to do was change their boiler. Um, and then they decided to insulate their loft and insulate their floor. And then they, a couple of years later, when they had a bit more money, they insulated their sort of walls. They're in a 1960s terraced house. Um, and then a couple of years after that, when they had said a bit more, then they changed their windows. So they managed to do it in a step-by-step -step way whilst living in the home, as and when they have money to do different parts of the job. So you can certainly do approach this in very different ways. Um, the main thing is having understanding what you're doing and plan, planning to do a whole house um, sort of take a whole house approach um, rather than um, just doing something that you might have to then undo in the future because you've not quite thought through how it fits in with other parts of your home if you see what I mean. Next slide please. 
So um, there are more case studies and I've, I've just put this on to show that there are quite a lot of different um, way. We've got a few videos of different members talking about how they've approached retrofit. So do just follow that link and have a look at the different videos after the session if you're interested. Next session. Next session. Next slide, please. The challenges. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a couple of key challenges. Um, around decision making, around finding contractors, around making sure the quality of works are good, um, and around finance. So next slide please. I'll just talk through these. I realise I'm kind of running a bit behind time. Um, so decision making. We did a focus group a couple of years ago um, where I sort of asked members sort of about their journey around retrofit and realised that quite a, a common aspect to lots of different people's journeys that they got really enthused through events like this or through going to see other people's homes that have been retrofitted or reading around and you know got really motivated and then sort of actually when they started looking into it, there's so much choice there's so many options so many different types of materials that they kind of got a bit um stuck with the decision making and i think um what really we sort of have run quite a few sessions i recommend checking out our webinars to help with that um next slide please but a tool that we've developed to really help with this Next slide is um, it's called the Home Retrofit Planner. We used to call it My Home Energy Planner, which you might have come across. So this is um, it's a home energy assessment, but it's also really a decision making tool. So it involves um, an assessor coming to your home, doing a sort of two hour interview. I mean, it's, it's a bit different now because of COVID. So lots of the interviews online and then sort of measuring your home. It uses um, SAP methodology to with a couple of modifications sort of look at model what your home how much energy it uses now and then if you made various changes how much energy it would use depending on which measures you right i mean it really ha helps in terms of decision making it's obviously not uh it's it's quite a, it's 500 pounds for the assessment so it's not cheap so it's really for those people who are kind of thinking i'm i'm really serious about this i'm gonna I want to be able to spend a significant amount of money so i, I mean it, it depends on who you are and what your budget is but maybe if you're spending say 20 or thirty thousand pounds on a retrofit then you know, spending some money on understanding what different types of measures would make sense and how they would fit in with other measures and um, really helps so we've developed that but also things that you can do is just come at well i'll talk a little bit more about carbon carp in a bit but come along to some of our socials and talk to other members about how they've sort of come through thinking through some of these decisions and um, talk to other people in sustainable living for the Heatons and things like that. Next slide, please. I have five minutes, please. Thanks, Mel. Um, so I might, I might speed up a little bit. Um, contractors. So it is a challenge um, finding contractors. Sometimes people get the assessment, know what they're going to do, but then the next hurdle is really figuring out who to, who to use. There are different options. You could decide to do it yourself. Um, if you're going to do that, which is great, especially things like lofts and floors, it is possible to do stuff and, and doing some draft proofing. But it's definitely worth getting some advice and just making sure you're not going to make any changes that will cause problem harm to your home afterwards. Um, you can use mainstream contractors and I think um, it is possible to use mainstream contractors to do energy efficiency works um, to a good quality. I think important things are that you have a really, that they're a good contractor, that you've got a good lines of communication with them that they're open to learning and um, we also are very open to working with mainstream contractors to support them to do the kind of works that you want doing um, so and that's a really good for us because we obviously we want more contractors to understand energy efficiency so if if they're getting demand they're getting a client that says we want you to be our contractor but we want you to do it like this and they're open to that that is brilliant in terms of changing things in Manchester um, and then there are specialist contractors who are very engaged in energy efficiency but obviously they are very booked up and quite busy so if you want to if you want to stick to a specialist you might just have to be prepared to wait next slide please um, it's important to be aware of quality of work so in these slides they're both there's external wall insulation on both of those um, you can see that above the door on the left unfortunately this is quite these are quite typical pictures they're kind of not insulated over on the lintels above the doors the insulation sort of stops a bit above the floor they've not insulated between the windows on the right hand picture and that's a problem because obviously heat um, will that they act as what we call thermal bridges or cold bridges so 
the heat will transfer out of those uninsulated areas faster than other parts of your house. So you'll lose energy, even though you will have done the insulation work. And you might get mold growth on the inside because they'll obviously be the coldest points in the house, um, in that corridor, for example. So you really, there are risks associated to doing these kinds of works and you really want to make sure that you don't, um, don't cause harm to your home. Next slide, please. Um, and finance. So um, we actually find that quite a lot of people that engage with us actually have the finance. And often people talk about it as an issue, but we don't, when we want to do a bathroom or do an extension or redo our kitchen, we don't really think about payback and actually we save the money to do that. And we kind of think, um, we've actually come across a lot of people that think like that about retrofit. So we're not, we don't think it's such a significant issue. Um, it definitely will be when it comes to mainstreaming it further, but for now it's not. Um, there is the Green Homes Grant Scheme, which I assume some of you have heard about. Next slide, please. So I'll just spend the last couple of minutes talking about the Green Homes Grant Scheme. So um, importantly, there's, we did an hour and a half webinar a couple of weeks ago on it, and it's a really great webinar. So if you are seriously considering getting a Green Homes Grant voucher, please do watch that webinar. And um, we've also got more information on our website, on a blog that we wrote. So click, check that out too. And actually the video, you can, the video is linked from the blog. So I would definitely recommend looking at those two things. Um, next slide, please. But just briefly, so the government are offering all homeowners £5,000, um, £10,000 if you are a in fuel poverty. They can be spent on a couple of limited number of primary measures, which then unlock secondary measures. So they can be spent on sort of installations or room and roof, um, wall insulation, cavity insulation, cavity wall insulation, all sorts of things like that, and also various types of renewable heating measures. Um, it's a £2 billion scheme that opens from the end of this month, and the programme ends by the 31st of March. So that's really important. The time scale is very short, um, which could impact the quality of work depending on which contractor you get. So something to be aware of. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to understand that if you are getting, if the government will lend up to two thirds of the total cost of the works. So say you go for the maximum £5,000, you'll also have to contribute 2500 to match it. So just so everyone's aware. Um, and the value of the primary measures will dictate what could be spent on the secondary measures. Second, next slide, please. So just a quick thing on some of the pros and cons. Obviously it's free money. Um, it's the opportunity to do some of the works, some of the works that you might be planning, save some money um, and carbon. Um, it could help the economy and some elements of the supply chain. Um, and there is some, there's lots of incentives at the moment that various um, organisations are doing to train new people in this area. Um, but really important to consider whether you've got a plan for the whole house or you're just going for this bit of money. Um, you really, it's important that you take a holistic approach. You know, heat, heat doesn't really mind where you insulate or what you do. Um, if you insulate one wall, it will travel through an uninsulated part of the house. So you really need to think about your home as a whole rather than taking it in parts and, and consider how, what you might, you know, what you might put in now will link to things that you do in the future. Um, so yeah, just really don't rush into it. Just have a good think about what you're planning and how it's going to work. Um, it's important to consider whether you're paying over the odds because it's a government scheme and the contractors working in the scheme might up the prices because they know that you're getting some grant funded works as a potential a potential issue um and also are you getting the right people to work on the project so unfortunately we work with a lot of small scale um builders and sort of trades people in Man manchester who can't actually get onto this scheme because um they're too small to be able to do the admin work and the um the pay the accreditation fees. So there's a lot of good people that could be doing good works in your home that can't actually do your work in the home through this scheme. At the same time, there might be some people who are accredited who could do work on your home, but just be a little bit suspect and don't go with the first contract you find. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, I think, you know, yeah, we're a, we're a community benefit society based in Manchester. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, we've been doing a webinar program throughout since March, and we have there's a wealth of information. So I really do recommend going on that link and having a look at the webinars that we've recorded. 
Um, home health check, I've sort of talked more about humidity and temperature and insulation, not insulation, ventilation and indoor air quality. So you can check that out. Um, we've got a beginner's guide to retrofit, which is a monthly webinar that we run. So you can either come along to a live one, which happens once a month, where I go sort of into more depth and into the things I've been talking about today, um, or watch that recording. Um, yeah, there's a whole load of really interesting webinars in there, so I do recommend checking that out. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And um, people pad retrofit. So this is, we're piloting the service. Um, it's a hand-holding service that takes you from just interested, getting some advice to getting a home assessment. And then we support you to find, to draw, to create a brief around what works you wanna do, um, to find contractors, to support those contractors with on-site training and then um, evaluate the project to the end. So it really, we sort of realized that we needed to support people right through the whole process rather than just provide assessments. And yeah, that's going well. We're getting our first clients on site this autumn, so it's been quite busy. Um, next slide, please. I think that's the end. Great. Well, I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A um, and I hope that was useful. Thank you. So thank you, Nika. Uh, that was really, really useful, very helpful. Um, and we're now going to see hear from uh, Julian uh, Scott, and he's going to uh, tell us his journey starting using the fabric first approach. But I think um, as he started doing this, he didn't actually know about the concept. Over to you, Julian. Uh, hey, Mal. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I was uh, utterly clueless about the direction I was going in. We, we bought a house in the Heatons in November 2015. Uh, it's a, 19, a style of a 1930s semi, it's about 2,000 square feet. Um, but when, quickly when we moved in, we discovered that the heating gas and electric bills were about three times the price we'd been paying previously. So previously, I think we'd been paying about 120 quid a month. Um, but we were facing bills of 300 quid a month. So we realised that um, the house was dealing with energy in quite an inefficient way. In, in some ways, we weren't too bothered about that because we knew we had got some work that we wanted to do. There was a very inefficient kitchen diner at the back of the house that had a non-building regs compliant conservatory as part of it. It also had a very old floor-mounted floor -mounted boiler. So we knew that there were inefficiencies in the house that would be updated pretty quickly. So starting the following April and carrying on till the October of 2016, we added, we knocked down some of the back of the existing house and added a new kitchen diner extension that included um, triple glazed roof lights, triple glazed Viking windows, 200 millimeters of solid floor, underfloor insulation, 300 millimeters of roof insulation. We also added solid cavity wall insulation in the new build fit of the house. We also added, and, and Anika mentioned it in her talk, um, ceiling tape around the windows to try and minimise uh, cold spots, cold bridges where the windows went into the walls. Um, the result of all that work was that we had a lovely tasty kitchen diner. Unfortunately, the, it had an effect on the rest of the house. Uh, and really unbalanced the heating. So the rest of the house in some ways became even colder because it wasn't anything like as energy efficient as this new back of the house. Uh, and unfortunately our energy bills were still sort of 300 pounds a month, which was a bit of a concern for us. We got Bosch Worcester in to have a look at their boiler to make sure that it was working properly. And we also got them to redo energy calcs to make sure that we had actually fitted the right size of boiler in the house. Got those calcs back and also got the report from Bosch saying yes the, the boiler's working fine. So really we knew that the house was just leaking a lot of energy and was dealing with uh, heating in a very inefficient way. The worst one really in the house was the lounge. It was just a uh, it felt quite a cold and damp place. It wasn't a particularly nice place to spend an evening. Um, so we had to look at ways to make that room and other parts of the house better. Ecospheric in Chalton had, had supplied the Viking windows to us, but we knew that those triple glazed, modern triple glazed windows wouldn't be the right look for a 1930s semi. 
Um, so we asked Lucas Ferro to recommend for other recommendations uh, as who we could go to for more energy efficient windows that would fit the style of the house. And they recommended reddish joinery and over time reddish joinery of um, fitted um, hardwood double glazed windows that encapsulate the original lead lights um, throughout the front of the house. And that has made a real difference. The house is notably warmer um, at the front end of the house as well now. Um, but the lounge still wasn't perfect. It was still cold in places. So, so we realised that there was still work to do. The first thing we looked at, as, as Anika mentioned, was um, issues around maintenance. And we discovered quite quickly that there was um, some cracking in the rendering, which was letting some water into the house. That cracking turned out to be quite extensive. So at that point, we weren't able to look any further at doing cavity wall insulation to improve that element of the house. So the next stage we looked at was underfloor insulation. And we did that over, I think, one weekend or one and a half weekends, where we installed under the whole of the ground floor, apart from the kitchen diner that already had the solid insulation, we installed 200 millimetres of hemp uh, insulation under all the rafters. And again, that made a, made a real difference to um, how the house felt generally underfoot. It did, it did feel warmer, but we were still having some issues in the lounge. It, it still wasn't a particularly nice place to sit down. We'd also had, uh, by this point, uh, our bedroom um, remodeled and again had some Viking windows fitted from Ecospheric, again, triple glazed high, high performance windows. We'd also added more loft insulation and um, airtight loft hatch, again, to minimize uh, uh, heat escape, essentially. Um, the difficulty we found though, was that unfortunately, um, despite having fitted these high performance windows, fitted for the loft insulation and the loft hatch, that actually the bedroom wasn't that warm. Um, and at this point, I realized that, although I'd sort of been muddling my own way through here, we really did need some help. Uh, and I, this is when I spotted uh, Mel's Warm in Winter advert in the Moore magazine. So I got more Mel round, he had a look at the house and, and gave us some advice. He noticed, he gave us a uh, thermometer and hydro hydrometer meter, and we noticed that there was too much humidity in the bedroom. And it turned out that was for two reasons. One, the radiator in the bedroom had been undersized. Um, so we needed to fit a bigger radiator. And secondly, the extractor fan in the ensuite next to our bedroom wasn't working properly and so wasn't taking out enough of the damp air. Once these two issues were rectified, the temperature in the bedroom did improve and in particular the humidity in the bedroom did improve. That isn't quite the end of the story though in, in relation to that room. That room has got um, ex external walls on three of the walls, so really we will need to do uh, cavity wall insulation there at some point to really get that room um, to a better temperature. Mel also had, had another suggestion for the lounge downstairs and recommended a chimney sheep, which is a two inch thick uh, piece of felt that is cut to the size of your chimney and installed to prevent heat loss air being sucked from the room straight at the chimney and outside. So that, that did improve um, the temperature in the lounge in particular. Mel also had a look at some of the underfloor insulation work that I had done and discovered that in a couple of areas I've done a bit of a shod shoddy job and in particular recommended that I put more insulation between the skirting boards and the um, outside walls. Um, so ceiling round each room under, under the floor. And again, that has improved the insulation. Sorry, that has improved the warmth in that lounge. So we're re really pleased about that. There's still more jobs to do um, on top of the bay windows, for instance. But often with bay windows, you have a, a lead cap to it where it doesn't meet the existing roof. Um, and those lead caps are often fully uninsulated. So despite fitting nice, performance double glazed unit, double glazed windows, 
you're still getting heat loss tipping out of the top of the house. Um, but where are we now in terms of costs? Well, actually, much better than we were. So our heating costs are now down from 300 odd pounds a month down to more like 160 pounds a month. The, the house is now much warmer throughout the house, but there is still work to do. We've got, to, we've got to fix the render at the front of the house so we can have the cavity wall insulation fitted. Uh, as I say, we've got to have a look at the lead above the bay windows. I also want to look at in time doing solar tubes and it may be that the government grant coming up might be a nice way to do that. And we're also going to have to have a look at some efficient way of um, re-insulating the loft because we're right on the borderline of 2.2 meters which you need for building regs to keep it as a usable space. So I think we've really made some good progress on the house in the last five years or so but the, there's still more to do but overall it's much warmer than it was. I'm happy to answer any questions. Right, thank you, uh, Gillian. That's you told us a, a who done it on your property, really, haven't you? <laughs> All right. So, so I, I think it's a really good example of the interaction that takes place between ourselves as uh, householders, the property itself, and the weather, uh, and how, uh, in order to do a competent retrofit, that as householders we do need to begin this journey understanding our properties well so i think that, that was very well told and thank you uh, to, to julian for that i'd like to go into the questions now please um should we start with um a question from john he says how would you measure things like humidity would you like to help us with that anika Yeah, so I, I put a link in there actually. There's something called a hydrometer, which measures um, relative humidity and temperature. And that's a way that you can have a look at what the humidity is in your home. Um, I also put a link into the chat box. Um, so we've been using um, sort of Matt, who also works at Carbon Corp, has written quite a detailed guide into different ways that you can um, measure environmental data from your home. Uh, and actually log it. So I, I recommend having a look at those two links and there's a little bit as to why it's important. Um, yeah, so but do feel free to email me if you've got more questions about things like this. I also recommend checking out the Home um, Health Check webinar that we wrote, which has got more on that. So hopefully that helps answer your question. But if you just, a really cheap and easy thing to do is just maybe get one or two, maybe even three hydrometers and hydrometers, sorry, and put them in different parts of your house and just keep an eye on it and check you know, your humidity wants, your relative humidity wants to be really be between 40 and 60 percent. So not too dry and not too wet. Um, and it, it's easier to, that, that's a little bit hard to do during the winter, during the, this time, sort of autumn, because often our heating isn't on, but it might be quite humid outside. There's lots of reasons as to why that's the case. Um, yeah, I, which is a whole other presentation. So I won't go into too much depth, but there, there's some of the quick, easy things you can do. Check it's between 40 and 60, relative humidity, um, and um, biohydrometer is quite cheap. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I, I can add to that uh, as, as I do uh, work, of, as, as um, Julian has explained, I, I do inspections on people's houses. And the thing I always leave with somebody is the thermometer and hygrometer. They're only 15 pounds and screw fit. They tell you exactly what's going on in your property in a way that your body isn't always going to tell you. Uh, so, that, so that it's £15 well spent if you'd like to do that. Um, I'd like to move next to a question, um, which is how much did Lorenzo and Paul's changes cost? How much does a roof insulation cost and what sort of boilers are best? There's, quite, there's actually three questions there. Perhaps we should just start with the budget one. How much did it cost? I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't answer it. Um, okay terms of the roof insulation again that's a very broad question and not one that I have an easy pull out of my hat answer for because it really depends on your roof what insulation you decide to go for which you know who the contractors are what kind of work are you replacing your loft hatch are you doing it yourself I mean there are lots of there are lots of ifs in that or questions and that's so it's a hard thing to just give you a number for um, and in terms of what boilers are best Again, I don't know the answer to that question. I also think um, 
if you have made your home less drafty, more airtight and insulated it, it might be a good thing to think about in heat pumps, um, air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps, which are available on the Green Homes Grant Scheme. But again, if your home's quite inefficient and you go for something like a heat pump, you might end up spending a lot of money on energy. Um, they won't necessarily work their best if they aren't, um, if you haven't done your fabric improvements first. And also if they're not, you know, you need to get ones that are designed well. We've done a whole course on heat pumps actually, which I think lots of the, well, the videos on that are on our website as well. So we've got plenty of you for you to watch and have a look at. So sorry, I haven't been able, I can't give you any exact answers there, but I hope that helps you understand how to get more information. And, and, and can, can I add something here as well? Because I think Anika's problem in, in answering that question is actually um, simply because uh, you, you do need to know a property inside out if you're going to invest in good quality and sustainable uh, insulation, uh, because this is a combination of things. It's about the insulation, it's about the uh, tightness, and it's about how you deal with humidity. And if you haven't got the fabric right at the beginning, and you, if you don't understand the fabric, the recommendation would be, I do go and ask an expert to help you with that. Um, Carbon Corp, you know, do this service. Uh, building surveyors and others will also do this service. And I think it's the kind of thing you need to think about in terms of, if you really are going to spend perhaps 10 or 20,000 pounds over the next 10 years on your home, spending 500 pounds understanding it right at the beginning is money really well spent because it does mean that you will, make, you will use your money wisely for the following 10 years. So I say that as a rather heartfelt thing, but I've seen so many mistakes where people have just done things thinking they understood the house and they really did not. So next up is a question. It's on the green scheme, on the, uh, the government's uh, green homes grant scheme. Do the whole works have to be finished by March 21? Or is it, sorry about that, or is that the end date for getting approval to be part of the scheme? No, uh, your, the works have to be complete, is my understanding at the moment. Um, in terms of getting approval to be a part of the scheme, so that the vouchers are available, you can register now, in fact. Um, I think they're going to make the vouchers available by the end of this month. Um, there's more detail, you can find more detail on the blog that I shared as to the process. But I really do recommend, I really highly, highly recommend if, if, if you're going to go for the, that scheme, given that, um, given that there are, it's quite easy for contractors um, to make, you know, even good contractors to do things that might end up causing unintended consequences in your home. Um, you don't you don't want to go down that route because it might become more expensive to repair any issues that go wrong. So you really want to make sure that you are use use that grant funding well. Um, so do watch the webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago on this to get a bit more sense. We, um, Liam, who works for us and he's had a lot of you know experience working practically as a builder, gave a real good insight into sort of higher and lower risk types of measures that you can go for and things to look out for in those different kinds of measures. So do watch that webinar. Get yeah. More yeah, please do, please do. And, and uh, my, my comment on this would be, it's called the Green Homes Grant, uh, but unfortunately it is actually a measure which is more about um, providing work for uh, industry or the, the building industry during the COVID process. And by pr uh, uh, putting a time limit of March 21 uh, and, and managing it the way they are, I'm not sure the government will actually get good value from this. So yes, as householders, if you're going to use it, uh, look into it very carefully. Right, I'm going to have to move on now as uh, I'm concerned to ensure that we do finish in time uh, uh, because of the closing session that follows this. So could I could have the next slide please. Next slide please. So what we'd like you to take away from this is as follows, that there is a change taking place uh, towards a carbon free world. Um, uh, and I think you and, and all of us as citizens and as consumers can help drive this change. We have shared some ideas with you to follow up and hopefully you will be able to do that through the court and through uh, uh, individual surveyors. Um, and we, uh, and, and at, last, at least some of this change will take place around you. So the extent to which you can do that by using um, organisations that work cooperatively, share ideas, join in, 
and get involved. That could be the co-op, that could be sustainable living in the Heatons, it could be others as well. Um, it's a great way of, of doing this and it means the information and the research that you do will be done in, in a manner that is shared with others. So we'd hope you're able, you feel you're able to do that. So I'd like to finish by uh, moving to the next slide, which I hope will include a link. So yes, in about five minutes time, the closing session will begin. It's only about 20 minutes long. Uh, it's, it should be inspiring, and it's certainly if you haven't seen our three young people, I would highly recommend it to you give it the 20 minutes uh, uh, that it deserves and to watch the poem at the end. So at that point, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking part in the, in the festival over the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>